Spain, Ireland, and Norway recognize Palestinian statehood. What does this mean for Israel and the region? In a significant move that has stirred controversy, Spain, Ireland, and Norway have officially recognized a Palestinian state. This decision comes amid ongoing conflict in the region, particularly in Gaza. The three countries hope to accelerate efforts to secure a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez emphasized the importance of recognizing a unified Palestinian state, including the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, with East Jerusalem as its capital. This decision brings the total number of UN member states recognizing Palestine to 146. While Spain, Ireland, and Norway see this move as a step towards peace and a two-state solution, Israel has strongly condemned it. Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz accused the countries of supporting Hamas and inciting genocide against the Jewish people. The European Union remains divided on the issue, with some members already recognizing Palestine and others hesitant to do so. Meanwhile, the conflict in Gaza has led to escalating tensions between Spain and Israel, with diplomatic measures taken by both sides. Global Momentum 145 nations recognize Palestinian statehood. The conflict in Gaza has reignited the global call for Palestinian statehood. In a historic move, Norway, Spain, and Ireland have joined the ranks of nations recognizing a state of Palestine, defying traditional Western diplomacy which linked Palestinian statehood to negotiations with Israel. This decision, while celebrated by many, has sparked outrage in Israel, highlighting the complexities of the Middle East peace process. Israel's war in Gaza, triggered by the October 7 attack, has prompted a resurgence of support for Palestinian statehood worldwide. The recognition by Norway, Spain, and Ireland brings the total number of UN member states recognizing Palestine to 145, encompassing countries from the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Since Yasser Arafat's proclamation of an independent Palestinian state in 1988, momentum for recognition has steadily grown. Algeria was the first nation to extend recognition, followed by numerous others across continents. Recent waves of support, notably from South American countries and Sweden in 2014, have underscored the global push for Palestinian sovereignty. The United Nations has played a pivotal role in the Palestinian quest for statehood. Despite unsuccessful attempts at full UN membership, Milestones such as UNESCO's acceptance of Palestine as a full member and the General Assembly's upgrade of Palestinian status to non-member observer state have marked significant progress. The International Criminal Court's acceptance of Palestine as a state party further solidifies its international standing. In Europe, Sweden's recognition in 2014 paved the way for others to follow suit. Israel's actions in Gaza have galvanized support in the region leading to recent acknowledgments from Norway, Spain, and Ireland. The decision by Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez is hailed as a move towards historic justice. The tide may be turning further, with Malta, Slovenia, Australia, and even France considering recognition under the right circumstances. However, opposition persists, particularly from Israel and its allies. The intricacies of Middle Eastern geopolitics continue to shape the discourse on Palestinian statehood. As the global community grapples with the complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, recognition of Palestinian statehood remains a contentious yet crucial step towards lasting peace and stability in the region. Netanyahu vows to continue war amid international condemnation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pledges to persist with the war against Hamas despite widespread condemnation following an airstrike in Rafah that claimed numerous Palestinian lives. The strike, labeled a tragic mishap by Netanyahu, has sparked outrage globally and led to calls for an immediate halt to hostilities. Netanyahu, addressing the Israeli parliament, expressed regret over the strike but emphasized the need to achieve all military objectives before considering an end to the conflict. He assured that Israel is taking precautions to avoid civilian casualties, though acknowledging the tragic outcome of the Rafah incident. International bodies, including the UN Security Council, have swiftly condemned the strike, with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres denouncing it as an attack on innocent civilians seeking refuge. Despite mounting pressure, Netanyahu remains resolute in his commitment to continue the offensive. The strike, 
which targeted Hamas commanders, resulted in significant civilian casualties, drawing criticism from humanitarian organizations like Medicines Sans Frontiers, MSF. MSF decried the attack on a populated area designated as a safe zone, highlighting Israel's disregard for civilian lives. While the U.S. acknowledges Israel's right to self-defense, it insists on measures to protect civilians. Questions arise about the precision of the strike and the presence of flammable material in the area, prompting calls for a thorough investigation. As Israel faces scrutiny over its military operations, the conflict in Gaza shows no signs of abating. Netanyahu's determination to achieve total victory underscores the challenges in resolving the crisis and the toll it exacts on civilian lives. Despite Sunday's tragedy, Israeli ground forces continue their advance cautiously, mindful of the implications of further escalation. However, the airstrike's devastating impact complicates Israel's narrative and adds urgency to calls for de-escalation and a return to dialogue. The conflict, ignited by Hamas's attack in October, has claimed thousands of lives and left many more displaced. As international pressure mounts, the need for a peaceful resolution becomes increasingly urgent to prevent further loss of life and alleviate the suffering of civilians caught in the crossfire. Russia outpaces NATO allies in artillery shell production, report. A recent report reveals that Russia is outpacing Ukraine's NATO allies in artillery shell production, producing shells three times faster and at a significantly lower cost. The analysis, conducted by consulting firm Bain & Company and reported by Sky News, sheds light on the disparity in armaments production between Russia and Western countries. According to the report, Russia's armaments industry is expected to manufacture or refurbish 4.5 million artillery shells this year, while the combined production of the US, the UK, and other European allies is projected to reach only 1.3 million shells. This stark difference in production capacity underscores Russia's ability to sustain military operations at a lower cost. The analysis further highlights the cost disparity between the types of shells produced by Western countries and those used by Russia. While Western produced 155 mm shells for Ukraine cost around $4,000 each to manufacture, Russia's 152 mm shells are significantly cheaper, costing approximately $1,000 each. This cost advantage allows Russia to maintain a high level of artillery firepower at a fraction of the expense incurred by its adversaries. Despite ongoing efforts by Ukraine's Western allies to support its military operations, including the recent release of a $61 billion U.S. aid bill by Congress, reports indicate that Ukraine continues to face challenges in matching Russia's military capabilities. The conflict in Ukraine has exposed weaknesses in Western countries' capacity to produce weapons and ammunition, highlighting the need for greater investment and modernization in defense industries. As the conflict in Ukraine evolves into a war of attrition, Analysts suggest that Russia is preparing for prolonged hostilities, banking on the belief that Western resolve and support for Kyiv may wane over time. The disparity in artillery shell production underscores the asymmetry in military capabilities between Russia and its adversaries, posing challenges for Ukraine and its allies in maintaining defensive lines against Russian aggression. Poland considers sending troops to Ukraine amid Russian advances, Foreign Minister. In a bold statement, Polish Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski suggested that Poland should not rule out sending troops to Ukraine as Kyiv struggles to fend off Russian advances. While Western allies have pledged financial and logistical support to Ukraine, the prospect of deploying soldiers to the conflict zone has been largely dismissed. Sikorski's remarks, published in prominent newspapers including Poland's Gazeta Wyborcza, Italy's La Repubblica, and Spain's El Pais, underscore Poland's willingness to keep Russian President Putin guessing about its intentions. Although Sikorsky did not specify the potential role of Polish troops, his comments signal a willingness to consider direct military involvement. The statement comes in the wake of French President Emmanuel Macron's suggestion of deploying Western troops to Ukraine for training purposes, indicating a shift in the stance of NATO allies towards more active engagement. Sikorsky himself has previously hinted at the possibility of NATO troop presence in Ukraine, signaling a departure from previous positions. Meanwhile, Ukraine's military struggles against well-entrenched Russian forces, compounded by delays in the delivery of weapons and ammunition. 
The failure of Kyiv's 2023 counteroffensive has emboldened Russia, leading to further territorial gains in Ukraine. As the situation in Ukraine escalates, the prospect of NATO troop deployment becomes increasingly plausible. The willingness of countries like Poland to consider military intervention reflects a growing urgency to support Ukraine in its fight against Russian aggression. North Korea warns against denuclearization amid trilateral summit fallout. North Korea issues a stern warning against denuclearization efforts, following a trilateral summit involving South Korea, Japan, and China. The North Korean foreign ministry condemns the summit as a grave political provocation, suggesting that any attempt to undermine its nuclear status would escalate tensions and hasten conflict. The joint summit, which emphasized peace and stability on the Korean peninsula, drew a sharp rebuke from Pyongyang, which views discussions on denuclearization as interference in its internal affairs. North Korea asserts its sovereign right as a nuclear weapons state and warns that denuclearization would create a power vacuum and increase the risk of war. While the summit refrains from explicitly calling for North Korea to abandon its nuclear program, the isolated regime interprets the discussions as a direct challenge to its sovereignty. South Korea speculates that North Korea's response may be directed towards Beijing, its closest ally, signaling dissatisfaction with China's perceived alignment with regional powers. Despite North Korea's defiance, South Korea reiterates the international community's consensus on denuclearization and urges Pyongyang to return to the path of denuclearization. The failed attempt to launch a reconnaissance satellite further complicates the situation as North Korea continues to flout international warnings and violate UN Security Council resolutions. The escalating tensions underscore the delicate balance of power in Northeast Asia and the challenges of navigating diplomatic relations in the region. As geopolitical dynamics evolve, the fate of denuclearization efforts remains uncertain, with North Korea's defiant stance posing a significant obstacle to regional peace and stability. Taiwan's legislative changes spark protests amid concerns over China's influence. Taiwan's opposition-controlled legislature has passed changes that critics say tilt towards China and curtail the president's authority. The amendments, advocated by the Nationalist Party and its allies, grant the legislature greater control over budgets, including defense spending, in what is viewed as a concession to Beijing. The Nationalists, who advocate for reunification with China, gained a slim majority in the legislature following January's elections. This shift in power contrasts with the presidency, held by Lai ching te of the Democratic Progressive Party, which favors Taiwan's de facto independence. Protests erupted outside the legislature, with thousands expressing discontent over the changes. Inside the chamber, tensions ran high as lawmakers from opposing parties clashed, reflecting deep divisions over Taiwan's future and its relationship with China. Critics argue that the amendments undermine Taiwan's democracy by expanding legislative oversight over the executive branch. The move has sparked concerns about Beijing's influence on Taiwan's political landscape and its implications for the island's sovereignty. China's persistent military maneuvers near Taiwan further underscore the challenges facing the island, as it seeks to maintain its autonomy in the face of growing pressure from Beijing. The United States continues to support Taiwan's defense efforts despite the absence of formal diplomatic ties, signaling a commitment to safeguarding Taiwan's security. As Taiwan grapples with internal political tensions and external pressure from China, the path forward remains uncertain. The legislative changes highlight the delicate balance between maintaining Taiwan's democratic values and managing its complex relationship with Beijing. China's resurgent role in Africa post-COVID raises concerns. China's economic engagement in Africa is resurging post-COVID, with a focus on minerals, according to a Reuters analysis. While Chinese leaders tout their investments as aiding Africa's modernization, critics highlight a relationship still dominated by extractive practices, challenging Beijing's rhetoric of win-win cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative. Chinese investment in Africa surged by 114 percent last year primarily targeting minerals crucial for both global energy transition and China's economic revival. However, this focus has widened Africa's trade deficit with China, raising questions about the sustainability and equity of the relationship. China's approach to infrastructure financing in Africa is evolving, with a shift towards public-private partnerships, 
PPPs, and equity stakes. While some projects, like Nairobi's Expressway, showcase success, the broader adoption of PPPs in Africa remains limited due to legal complexities and perceived market risks by Chinese companies. Despite challenges, China's total engagement in Africa reached $21.7 billion last year, making it the region's largest recipient of Chinese investment. However, African leaders are grappling with financing gaps for critical projects, highlighting the need for diversified and sustainable economic partnerships. China's pivot towards trade and investment is evident, with two-way trade hitting a record $282 billion last year. Yet, Africa's trade deficit with China widened, underscoring the imperative for value addition and diversification of exports beyond raw materials. Efforts to bridge this gap, including pledges to support manufacturing and agricultural modernization, face hurdles. Cumbersome regulations hinder African producers' access to the Chinese market, limiting the potential benefits of increased trade. As China doubles down on its engagement in Africa, questions persist about the long-term implications for the continent's development and sovereignty. Balancing economic opportunities with concerns over dependency and resource exploitation remains a key challenge for African policymakers navigating China's expanding footprint. Hong Kong police arrest six under new national security law. Hong Kong authorities make their first publicly known arrests under the city's new national security law, targeting individuals accused of publishing seditious social media posts. The arrests, including that of a former organizer of the Tiananmen Square vigil, raise concerns about eroding freedoms and crackdown on dissent in the semi-autonomous territory. Six individuals, including Chao Hang Tung, former leader of the vigil group, are accused of anonymously posting seditious content on Facebook. Secretary for Security Chris Tang alleges the posts aim to incite dissatisfaction against the Chinese central government, Hong Kong authorities, and the judiciary. While the authorities have not disclosed the specific content, the arrests come ahead of the 35th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square crackdown, a politically sensitive topic. Tang emphasizes the importance of vigilance against national security risks, citing the need to maintain stability despite ongoing prosperity. The introduction of the new security law in March, reminiscent of Beijing's law, has heightened fears of freedom erosion in Hong Kong. Under the law, offenders face harsher penalties, with maximum jail terms increased to seven years for sedition offenses. Despite assurances of retaining Western-style liberties until 2047, Hong Kong has witnessed a crackdown on dissent since the law's introduction. Civil society organizations, including the Vigil Group, have been disbanded and activists face arrests and restrictions on free speech and assembly. The arrests underscore Beijing's efforts to quell dissent in Hong Kong, with authorities justifying the law as restoring stability following mass protests in 2019. UAE President's State Visit to South Korea Defense and Energy on the Agenda The President of the United Arab Emirates, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, embarks on his first state visit to South Korea emphasizing defense industry cooperation, business investment, and energy initiatives. His arrival is marked by an honorary escort of fighter jets, symbolizing the deepening strategic partnership between the two nations. President Yoon suk Yeol and Sheikh Mohammed will discuss bolstering their special strategic partnership, focusing on areas such as defense, business, and energy. The UAE's $30 billion investment pledge in South Korean businesses underscores the significance of this visit. Key meetings with South Korea's business leaders, including Samsung Electronics and Hyundai Motor Group, highlight existing strong business ties between the two countries. South Korea's history of building nuclear reactors in the UAE and recent defense contracts signal the depth of their collaboration. South Korea's aspirations to become a major defense exporter align with the UAE's interests, reflected in recent defense agreements with Poland and Saudi Arabia. This visit is driving up South Korean defense stocks, indicating market optimism about the prospects of enhanced cooperation.